34-year-old man stands outside of a local bar with a camera on him on a cool spring evening in April of 2019. Intoxicated, he speaks freely to the media, even has a good chuckle about recent events. Two people that he's been living with are now missing, his recent girlfriend and her little girl. How are you feeling throughout all of this? <laughs> um, traumatized, of course. <clears throat> Um, it's been a very, um, very stressful experience, of course. Are you worried about them? Of course I am, yeah. They should be home. They all, all were, they, wherever they want to be. But I don't know where that is. And although he's hoping that his words would be believed by viewers and the crew, he later changes his story. And not only that, but he seems to have a bizarre proud-like proclamation of being the prime suspect. You were kind of the the primary suspect in this in this homicide I still investigation. Am. You, you still are. Um, I believe I'm still a suspect at this time. Um, of course, I was a suspect when I was in custody, um, and I guess I'll be a suspect going forward until they figure out that I'm not. It says the man that they released is is still a suspect so correct. is that your understanding of that to you from what i understand yes correct so do the police just have this very very wrong what's what's yes. your perspective they have it wrong as, as far as i'm concerned of course they do so why do the police think it's you why why are you the prime suspect just because you live there yes uh, i was the last person to see them that's why my name is Linda and welcome to It's a Crime, where I dive weekly into true crime cases and dive into the details. Today we're looking at the heartbreaking and shocking case of 34-year-old Robert Leeming and his two victims, 25-year-old Jasmine Lovett and her little 22-month-old daughter, Aaliyah Sanderson. They went missing and ended up being found deceased in a wooded area, an hour and a half away from where they lived. This case gives vibes of Chris Watts, you know, the family annihilator. And many people are touting Robert Leeming as Canada's Chris Watts. With a bizarre interview, lies, gasoline, dumping of bodies, a new love interest, and a made-up alibi, and a new tactic in the books, strategically placed bacon and a few new criminal buddies to help cover the truth. But of course, Robert's actions are justified with an explanation in Robert Leeming's mind, more than a few times. And he really does take things to a whole new level. So now, let's get into it. The story begins in Canada, in my neck of the woods, called Calgary, Alberta. It's a city with 1.6 million people and known for something called the Calgary Stampede, one of the biggest rodeos in the world. One million people come to visit each summer from all over the world with concerts and chuck wagon races and carnival rides. Calgary is also known for its drastic changes in temperatures. The difference in one day could be the difference of a freezing snowstorm with minus 30 degrees Celsius temperatures, while the next day you could be barbecuing in the sunshine with plus 20 degrees Celsius temperatures. For Americans, that's like going from minus 22 Fahrenheit to 68 Fahrenheit in 24 hours. It's termed a Chinook, a very familiar term with Calgarians. The joke is if you don't like the weather, just wait a day. So let's rewind to 2018. In 2018, single mom Jasmine Lovett was looking for love in the Stampede City, or Cowtown as some of us call it. Jasmine had her dating profile online, and in September of 2018, she met a British man named Robert Leeming. He came to Canada from England in 2013, and Jasmine and Robert seemed to hit it off. While Robert lived in England, he had fallen in love online with a Canadian girl named Sarah. Robert moved to the country, they soon got married and had a little baby boy. They divorced in 2017, and it wasn't an amicable divorce. And in the weeks leading up to their separation, Robert's ex-wife found some worrisome internet searches, and she questioned if she dodged being murdered. Sarah claimed in Robert's search history on his computer, there were articles that included an article about a mother and child who died in a house fire, and also an article about a dog being chained to a tree, one of those two stories came true. In 2018, Robert pled guilty to three charges of animal cruelty. He was charged with causing a dog to be in distress, failing to ensure the dog had adequate food and water, and failing to provide the dog with adequate shelter. Now, Robert drove outside of Calgary, and he left his dog Axel chained to a tree, and he left the dog there to die. But he told the ex-wife that he gave the dog away, and four days later, a peace officer found the dog. And it was reported that 
the dog was in distress. In divorce documents, Robert didn't deny these online searches and Sarah described Robert as cruel. Sarah wrote in an affidavit, it didn't leave my mind that he actually did one of those things. In Robert's affidavit, he reported having a firearms license, several guns, including two handguns and a shotgun, and owning about 60 knives in which he collected since he was seven years old. The knives range from half an inch long to eight inches in length. Now I wonder how did he bring these collection of knives over from England and get through customs? I wonder how that works. What are your thoughts? Back to Jasmine, only weeks after she and Robert met, Jasmine and her little girl Aaliyah moved in with Robert in an area called Cranston, a residential area in the south part of the city. Jasmine paid Robert both rent and expenses, and Robert testified that they moved in together in October 2018. When, when did she move in um, to the to the house? October. In October. Correct. And she and it was her and her daughter that moved in. Correct. Was it just the three of you living in the household? Correct. And, uh, and you said that you were, um, at what, when did you become romantically involved with her? On and off in, in, in that six month period. Yeah. So was she living there at the time? Correct. Okay, so just so I understand how the situation goes, you own the house. Correct. Um, she she and is a tenant, is a tenant yeah. along right. with Aaliyah? With her daughter. With her daughter, yes, correct. Okay, so the. That was the extent of your relationship. She rented from you. Correct. And you shared the home. Correct. Jasmine's sister Genevieve talked about the decision to move in and she said, I was concerned because Jasmine said she was going to move in with Robert, despite only having known him for a few weeks to a month. Naturally, as a sister, I had my concerns. Genevieve said that she thought the couple were moving too fast. And when she was asked to describe Jasmine and Robert's relationship, she said that they had a volatile relationship and they often argued. And she did describe the relationship as strange. It was very strange. It's like emotionally, it wasn't quite on the level that you'd think a relationship would be. I know Jasmine talked about having some issues in getting Robert to open up. Now, at some point, the couple broke up. Jasmine texted her sister saying, it's not working out and I'm not happy, but she stayed living there. Jasmine got pregnant, but the pregnancy was terminated months before she went missing. And even though they'd broken up off and on, they ended up getting back together. As time went on, though, Robert was turning his attention to another woman. As for the relationship between Robert and Jasmine's little girl, Aaliyah, Genevieve said that he really welcomed co-parenting Jasmine's daughter. She said he would cook for her, he would put Aaliyah to bed, he would watch Aaliyah if Jasmine had to leave the house. Robert seemed to be very fond of Aaliyah. Everything was about Aaliyah. He almost seemed to care more about Aaliyah than he did about Jasmine. Now you might be wondering about Robert's little boy, who I mentioned earlier. Sarah was granted a restraining order against Robert and it was said that Robert had supervised visits only with his son. Sarah also said that Robert emotionally destroyed her and she feared for her own safety as well as her son's. And there were a number of concerning incidents in their marriage. In April of 2019, six months after Jasmine and Aaliyah moved in with Robert, something horrific happened. On Monday, April 15th, Jasmine, Aaliyah, and Robert went to a family gathering. Surveillance video shows that Jasmine and Aaliyah were also seen in a grocery store that day. The court believes this was two days before Jasmine and Aaliyah were brutally murdered. The next day on April 16th, according to police, is when the two were last seen again in their Cranston home in Calgary. At some point between April 16th and April 17th is when the authorities believe the two were killed and sometime in the following days that they were transported and dumped. According to Robert, he said that he picked Aaliyah up from daycare that day while Jasmine was going on interviews. He said they got home, he got little Aaliyah a snack, and he said he saw Aaliyah start to climb a set of stairs. He then said she fell down the stairs. He said, I heard a thump and I saw saw her lying on the ground. She seemed all right. I picked her up and dusted her off. Robert said that Aaliyah seemed fine afterwards. He said he put her to bed. He said Jasmine came home and they ate dinner together and watched some TV. 45 minutes later, Jasmine went and checked in on Aaliyah and said something was wrong. And Robert said, I picked her up and found she was limp and unresponsive. He said that Jasmine was not able to revive her. He said he then went downstairs to go get his phone and Jasmine confronted him. He said, we were in the kitchen and we were both crying and shouting at each other. She stood up to me and pointed at me and asked if I had done anything to Aaliyah. Robert reacted to Jasmine. He said, I freaked out. I snapped and hit her with a hammer on the head. I remember hitting her twice. He then said he stood there for a while, but didn't hit her again. 
but saw that she was dying. He said, she was dying and I wanted it to stop. I went to the garage and picked up a 22 and shot her in the head. It was the only thing I thought could be quick. So he goes downstairs to get his phone, ends up hitting Jasmine with a hammer and she's lying there dying. And instead of him calling 911, he goes and gets his gun. During cross-examination in court, the Crown Prosecutor asked Robert about Jasmine and he said, she was lying there wounded but alive, correct? And you didn't call for help, right? And Robert responds, correct. He says, for all you know, you could have saved her. And Robert agreed and said it was possible. The prosecution says, but we'll never know because you shot her. And Robert replies, yes. In court, Robert said that he didn't hurt Aaliyah and he didn't kill her. He said, I loved her. She was a wonderful kid. I treated her as my own. I enjoyed being there for her. Now, during my research, it's not clear if he was still having supervised visits with his son. There's one point in body cam footage that he said he didn't get to see his son. I don't have my son, so, you know, it's kind of depressed about that. And just, you know, drink, love drinking a lot. Over the weekend, because I've pretty much been on my own. Now in court, when Robert was asked what happened next, he said, I tried to hide it all, admitting to covering up the evidence and the truth. And Robert Leeming went to great lengths to cover up what he'd done. He tried to use rolls of paper towel to sop up the blood from Jasmine's bashed head and rolled both Jasmine and her little daughter Aaliyah's body in blue and black blankets. And from there, he put the bodies in the trunk of his 2014 Mercedes. Now, later on in the investigation, Robert was seen laughing about his 2014 Mercedes because it wasn't able to be tracked like a newer model with its telematics. After placing the bodies into the trunk of the car, Robert then spent the next few hours cleaning and drinking. According to a medical examiner, it was later determined that Jasmine died from blunt force trauma to her head and she was also shot. Jasmine had three separate fractures on her skull, including a crack that extended down to the base of her skull. The amount of force would be significant to create those injuries. There was also a gunshot wound behind Jasmine's left ear and two bullet fragments were removed. From her autopsy, it was determined that the blunt force trauma happened first and then she was later shot, just as Robert had said. And little Aaliyah died from blunt force trauma. She had traumatic injuries to her head and bruises on the side of her face and her neck. It was determined that Aaliyah had bleeding in her brain and she would have died within three to six hours without medical treatment. Robert denied having anything to do with Aaliyah's death. Now sometime the next day on Wednesday, April 17th, Robert, having to make some major decisions, decides to drive out of town west of Calgary with the bodies in the trunk. He headed to an area called Bragg Creek, which has a population of about 600 people. The surrounding area called Kananaskis is a large wooded area where people go hiking and biking and camping. According to Robert, he said he sat there drinking beer and smoking before losing his nerve and drove back to the city with the bodies in his vehicle. Eventually though, he found a remote day use area just north of Bragg Creek. He found a spot for them. He then poured gasoline on their bodies and he said so wildlife wouldn't get at them. He returned again to the scene with a load of mulch to cover them up. Now it's interesting about the mulch for various reasons, but Robert lived in a townhouse style condo. So it'd be a little interesting what his reasons were for buying it, right? And having to answer to the authorities. What was he doing with a bunch of mulch? And I do wonder how much he bought. He also talked about mulch being in his vehicle later on in the investigation and made a comment about it smelling like death in there. Robert claimed that he hid the bodies so that he could get away with killing Jasmine, but he did maintain his innocence for Elia's death and knew he'd be blamed for it. Plus, I'm sure he was thinking that if he was caught and he was in jail, that it wouldn't be a good outcome for him knowing that he's a child killer. Let me know your thoughts below. Robert buried them and he buried them together in a shallow grave. And he said, I didn't want them to be apart, so I left them together. Almost a week later, on April 23rd, when Jasmine and Aaliyah didn't show up for Easter dinner, her family reported them missing. And on Wednesday the 24th, the authorities then paid Robert a little visit. They spent hours knocking on his door. Robert claimed that he was drinking and he was smoking, and so he didn't hear the officers. How's it going? Says so she's with her sister. Hmm. Well, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Alright, well, 
just going to take a quick look around. We need to have a look. So, sir, you're Robert? Yeah, I am. Okay. So... I mean, that's the door. I was sleeping. I sleep with plugs in and... Hey, well, we've been here for hours and hours and hours now, hey? Uh, banging on your door and... Ringing on the doorbell. Calling your phone. Door again. I, I'm, I've been drinking and smoking a lot, so... I'm okay. Okay, door. so... She's not with her sister. What do you mean? Well, that's what? the reason that we're here. Why do you think we're here? Is that the family's calling us, saying we haven't heard from our daughter and our sister. Yeah, it makes sense. Okay, that makes sense? Yeah. Okay, why does that make sense? Because I haven't heard from her either. Okay. So, do you guys get in some sort of argument? No, not that I'm aware of. Well, not that you're aware of. Like, you're not making a whole lot of sense no, to me, like, guy. No, like, like, I don't know what... What? what uh, sorry, I'm, I'm... still getting my bearings here. So, she's not with her family. But she did threaten... To move out. I don't know, like three weeks ago, we got into a, a tizzy. She, she threw a bunch of my stuff out, food, stuff like that. And I had a discipline to do about that. Um, but nothing like that would concern me. Nothing that would concern you. Okay. Like, I mean, I've, I've, had, I've had people living with me before, and they move out. You don't hear right, but this isn't just like a roommate. This is your girlfriend. No, it's more roommate than girlfriend. Okay. She's more of a roommate than a girlfriend? Yeah. Okay, so the last time that you saw Jasmine was when? Thursday. Okay, and at that time, you guys were A-OK -okay or fighting, or what was the status? I would say in the air, judging by what obviously has gone down. I mean, hers and she's not here, and we're looking for her, so... So what makes you believe that she's with her sister? She told me that, that she was going to go and spend Easter with them on Tuesday. I was talking about it because I don't have my son, so, you know, it's kind of depressed about that. And just, you know, drink, not drinking a lot over the weekend because I've probably been on my own, right? Okay. Does she have a car? I don't know. No, she doesn't have a license. Sorry. 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 We got a phone number for the sister. No, off the phone. Mom and start digging, but that doesn't drive. What's the slam wrap for? No. Just privacy. Huh? Privacy. Did you see the note on the door? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
He said there are 36 photos in total I thought were relevant to the case. Most photographs were deleted at the same time. Many of those photos were of Jasmine and Aaliyah or both. Three of the photographs were of firearms. By Thursday, April 25th, the missing case now became a homicide case. And this is where it gets bizarre. First, Robert loses his job in the morning. He was working as a heavy-duty mechanic. And shortly after he arrives home, the SWAT team come and pay Robert a little visit, and then the home is searched. I was uh, arrested by the uh, tactical team. Um, it's pretty extreme <laughs> from my experience. Um, of course, I'd never experienced this before, and um, they're, they're still investigating. So, um, at this point, uh, you know, they're still adding things up, and um, I can't, you know, I can't get to my property or anything like that. So. Robert put telescopic poles against the door and also had cellophane on the front door window so no one can peek in it. Along with the barricaded door and the cellophane on the window, Robert had put a pin code door lock on the master bedroom door of his house. One of the officers said, it's not something I'm accustomed to seeing on a bedroom door. Then comes the bacon. Police found raw bacon dispersed throughout Robert's home. Chunks of it, in fact. Robert placed a piece of bacon by a vent in, near the front door. And in the basement, he had placed a big chunk under the cover of a dry sump hole. In the kitchen, there was a large amount of it on top of a garbage in a container, and for the final touch, he draped a piece of bacon across the back of a dining room chair. In the courtroom, an officer talked about prying open the lid of the dry sump and finding the bacon. Officer Weeks said, This is one of the ones I thought was odd. It's raw bacon, and it's bacon that you would not find in strips. It seems relatively fresh. It appears to be recently placed. And the prosecutor asked about the rarity of the find. And the prosecutor says, this is the first time you've ever found bacon? That's correct, Officer Weeks said. And from there, authorities take Robert in for questioning. The next day on Friday, April 26th, Robert is released from questioning from the night before. And he's hanging out at a local bar waiting for his house to be returned to him. It's here where he does the bizarre interview. He does appear intoxicated in the video. He laughs off and on. He mixes up his timelines. And it is just plain odd. And yet fascinating at the same time. It's bizarre. And this is where it has the vibes of Chris Watts. And why he's called the Canadian Chris Watts. Only it does step up another level with him being intoxicated. In the interview, he talks about his arrest. He talks about his relationship to Jasmine and Aaliyah, not really committing that he's had a relationship with her. And he talks about last seeing them. Here's a bit of what he said about his arrest. Note the laughter. So how long were you in, in police custody? 24 hours, I think. And then they released you and, and you can't go home. So what have you been doing in the, in the meantime? Just been here, literally. They dropped me off here uh, around about midday and um, just waiting to for the uh, forensics to finish up my property and uh, I can go back home. Were you not sort of perplexed as to where they'd gone or why they were gone for five days? No, because they said that they were going to be having Easter with her sister, so of course nothing alarmed me. Um, until, of course, I got arrested. <laughs> so... So when you got arrested at that point, did you even know that they were considered missing persons? Um, no. Are, are you able to speak about anything in terms of um, your interactions with police? It's probably not appropriate this time. So you're, you're in a cell last night? You're in a, in a room? I, Describe last night. Um, last night was in a um, questioning room. I was there um, from. I was picked up. I, I would say I was picked up at around eleven o'clock, mm -hmm. and I spent the whole time in the room. Just one room, and the whole twenty-four hours you were in that. Correct. Room. Correct. And they leave you there for hours at a time and then come in? Describe, in, like, they, in, one guy yeah. come in and out, two guys come in? No, I, I, there was two detectives, and, and, and they were very pleasant to me and tra treated me with utmost respect and, and was obviously trying to get to the bottom so that we can find Aaliyah and Jasmine. Um, 
very, very pleasant offices. Uh, I have absolutely zero complaints. Um, did you answer their questions? Or did of course. Just talk? No, no, no. I, I did, of course. Of course. Yeah, we, we went through uh, all the timelines to try and figure out see where they are. And, and um, yeah. Let me know your thoughts below. And here's where he talks about his relationship with Jasmine, or not relationship. Um, was there any romantic involvement between the two of you, or is there? There was initially, but um, towards the end, no. Um, how, how would you characterize your relationship with Jasmine? Good. I mean, were you a boyfriend-girlfriend, or...? No, just, just good, good friends. And, uh, and you said that you were... Um, and what, when did you become romantically involved with her? On and off in, in, in that six month period. Yeah. You said she moved in in October. If you don't mind me asking, um, and you mentioned that it was on and off a, a romantic relationship with her, with Jasmine. Um, can you give me some sense of how long that was going on? Was that from October until now? No, or? no. Um, I'd like to know, no comment on that. Okay. Sorry, just, just. Fair enough. That's a little bit more uh, intricate than that, if you know what I mean. Sure. There's uh, more details in it. I'd like to talk about it right now. I don't what know do you think they are? I have no idea. I have no idea. Did she hang out with questionable people? Was she a good person? No, no, she was a good person. Nice person. Um, uh, yeah, I can't. There's, there was nothing negative that I would say about her at all. She, she was a lovely person. I had no issues with her. Is he the dad around a lot? I don't, no, not at all. Not at all? Not at all. The dad is not in the picture. Never came to the house? I never, never met him. So Robert declares that he's a prime suspect on camera, repeatedly. And he's laughing at how traumatized he is. Yet, he's dealing with his dirty little secrets behind the scenes and he's dealing with these worries while he's at the bar. Nine days after this interview on May 5th, 2019, something brilliant happens. Two guys approach Robert at around 7 p.m. that night near a liquor store, the same area where Robert was interviewed previously. The men approach Robert and strike up a conversation. They tell him that they recognize him from the interview, but they also say that a nosy neighbor has found evidence against him and that it might be important to him. And they say to Robert that they're willing to help him get rid of it, as long as he does something in return, some criminal work for them. One of the guys says, you're the dude from the news. You're like an effing rock star. Robert responds saying, hardly there's nothing rock star about my effing life right now, I'll tell you that. I've had my life turned upside down. What Robert didn't know were that these two guys were undercover officers and part of a four and a half hour sting called Operation Highwood. So the officers invite Robert to sit on a bench outside of a coffee shop and just chat. Suspicious, Robert asks the officers if they were police, but they denied they were. And in Canada, you don't have to say if you are or not. So the guys ask Robert if he wants to go for a beer. And he agrees, and to build trust, these guys start saying, hey, here's how you stay inconspicuous, and they start talking smack about the police. They said while hanging out that Robert was relaxed and jovial. So they finish their beer, and then they offer Robert a ride to take them to a covert location, which is a warehouse. Remember, they had that criminal activity they want him to do for them. So they arrive at about 8.15 p.m. The undercover officers show them a whack of guns. And in court, the officers explained that they were trying to build trust with Robert and show that they had a criminal background. It wasn't about intimidation. The officer said it's a dirt on dirt mentality. After two hours from meeting, Robert was still a little skeptical. And he asked his new friends, I don't know how it works in this country. If I ask if you're cops, you have to tell me, right? The officer replies yes, but then says, you ever ask me again after this, then I'm not gonna be happy about it. Robert asks, you heard and seen what entrapment is, right? That night, it was said that they visited a few different locations. And even though Robert was suspicious of these guys, he starts opening up to them. The guys offer to help him get rid of the bodies and Robert leads them right to the victims. Robert said about the authorities, they are looking very, very far away from where they should be. So the trio looked at the map on a phone. The officer asked, what are we looking for, them? And Robert nodded. 
They said, you'll never have to worry about it again. Robert shook their hands and then led them to where the bodies were. He led them to the Kananaskis area outside the city called Grizzly Creek. It was around 4 a.m. on Monday, May the 6th that Jasmine and Aaliyah were discovered. They were found in a shallow grave under brush, branches, and mulch. They were doused in gasoline and wrapped in blankets, and they both had blue plastic bags around their heads. According to the authorities, they said, even with my face mask on at the time, there was this very, very strong smell of gas that was present. The smell was quite overwhelming, probably one of the strongest gasoline smells I've encountered during my 13 years working in the field of forensics. One of the guys asked Robert what did Jasmine do to him to make him angry, and Robert replied she wanted too much, she wanted to get married. He also told them that Jasmine knew he was seeing someone else, and he ends up telling these guys about the bacon. He said, do you want to know why they are so pissed off with me? I put bacon in my basement because pork is the closest thing to uh, people in the way that uh, dogs react to them. And he says, they said we're going to come in with cadaver dogs, so I thought, well, that's interesting. When asked why he picked that specific spot in Kananaskis, he said, never been there before, that's why. But we do see a pattern with the dog, how he took the dog out to the forest and chained them to the tree. And yet here's this pattern of Robert taking the girls and bringing them out to the forest. Robert was then arrested and brought into custody. He was charged with two counts of second degree murder. He pled guilty to murdering Jasmine and not guilty for Elias. On January 24th, 2022, he was found guilty on both accounts. And the judge noted in court that Robert lied continuously throughout his testimony. He said, Mr. Leeming is not a believable witness. And the judge said that the medical examiner's report indicated that a fall could not do that to Aaliyah. And the judge didn't believe that Robert heard a thump. And because of little Aaliyah's injuries, it was said that she would have lost consciousness, suffered seizures, and would have been gasping for air. The judge said, Mr. Leeming did not testify to any of this. This court does not accept Mr. Leeming's evidence. And the prosecution stated, he told lie after lie after he murdered Jasmine and Aaliyah. He lied to the police. He lied to the public. He lied to his ex-wife. He lied to his employer. All of this was a calculated scheme to get away with murder and not just one, but two. Robert Leeming's sentencing was supposed to be on February 11th and now it's for April of 2022. Jasmine's mom, Kim Blanker, talked about court and she said at one point they thought he was falling asleep, so we stopped for a little bit to wake him up, which is extremely weird. Back when this first happened, there was a GoFundMe to help with the funeral costs of Jasmine and Aaliyah, and there was extra money left over. So what the family did was they opened three new pet-friendly rooms at the Calgary Women's Emergency Shelter and plaques with Jasmine and Aaliyah's name are on each room. Jasmine's mom said Jasmine was the best mom. She really loved being a mom. She was very kind, very sweet girl. She said, we are trying to move forward and think of only positive things and happy memories and keep their spirits close and move forward that way, but it's been very difficult. And when little Aaliyah was found, she was found with a little shirt that says, I heart hugs. Two senseless, brutal murders that have left the family shattered. I'll keep you up to date on what happens with Robert and his sentencing. The concern for many is he won't get much time. But if he did get parole because of his status in Canada, he'll be sent back to the United Kingdom. Check out some of my videos here. Please let me know what you'd like to see next. Please subscribe if you haven't done so already. Please like and please share. Thank you so much for watching. See you soon. Robert was still a little skeptical. Ske skeptical? Skeptical. I always say skeptical. Oh, I gotta remember to put the Mercedes thing in. If I could do that whole thing, just keep going. And not only that, but he seems to have a bizarre proclamation. A 34-year-old man stands outside of a local bar with a camera on him on a, sp on a spool crane evening. 